Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight here uh, at uh, First Assembly. And I do apologize. Last week, we were not able to do uh, this Bible study. I had some family obligations, but it's great to be back. Great to be with you here this morning. Uh, not this morning, this evening. <laughs> and um, and it's good. God is, God is good. We are happy to be here. Let me get some uh, of my PowerPoint ready here today, uh, tonight. Um, and we're back in the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis 18, and we did Genesis 18 before. This would be uh, the second part of Genesis 18, and uh, this is Abraham's prayer, Abraham's famous prayer of intercession. And so this is uh, the part we are starting. Um, we, are, we are starting uh, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, this is this is uh, just an incredible, incredible story. So first of all, let me get some things out of the way. If you if you uh, appreciate this ministry and you would like to give to it, you can go to CapeMayFirstAssembly.org and give there. You can also um, uh, uh, text to give, uh, dial six, text 609-400-4075. We appreciate your faithfulness in, in giving, and uh, we appreciate those of you who support this ministry uh, by prayer and also by your gifts. Hi, Antoinette. Good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, you like my haircut? I don't think I got a haircut. Well, it's probably I probably got a haircut a couple weeks ago, but thank you. I am growing this really pathetic and sad beard that this is this has taken me like all month to grow this. It's it's really sad. <laughs> but um but anyway, there it is. Uh so um yeah, I I so we're talking about Abraham tonight and we just uh well, a couple of weeks ago we talked about Sarah and Abraham when these three visitors come and um they say, Abraham, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Antoinette. Uh, they, 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 they come and they say, Sarah's going to have a child. We're going to come back around this time. God speaks with uh, two other men. Uh, we know that this could be uh, the Trinity, or it seems like here it could be that these were the angels that go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Uh, but... Um, uh, Abraham, uh, well, God tells Abraham, Sarah's going to have a baby. And we know Sarah laughs and God says that you're going to call, uh, this baby Isaac, which means laughter. Both Abraham and Sarah laughed at this promise because it was just so amazing and so unbelievable. And yet, uh, they, they were able to put their trust in God. Not, com not completely. Obviously it was strange for them, but God moved in a powerful, powerful way. Um, and, and so we're talking about that and we're talking about God giving this promise, but then God turns and he says, um, uh, the, the, he says, should I, um, tell Abraham what I'm about to do? Um, uh, and, um, basically, uh, talks about how Abraham is going to be the father of many nations and gives the idea of this promised seed, uh, coming from Abraham. And then he starts to discuss with Abraham, uh, what is he going to do? And he, he's kind of like talking out loud uh, or, or asking this question out loud saying, should I talk, to, should I tell Abraham what am I, what I am about to do? And of course the answer is yes, uh, because Abraham is going to be the father. That he's the one that's going to be where the seed comes from. So God is asking and answering his own question here. And, uh, and this is what he says here. He says, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they, whether they have done uh, all together according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Um, so this, this starts with... Um, uh, a very interesting idea here uh, that that uh, evil has an outcry to it. Um, when um, when there is evil, people are oppressed. People are are hurt by evil, and there's an outcry to God. It, it gives us an insight here about how God's judgment works because this this question that God asks is not. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a normal. Uh, it's a normal 
reaction for God. In other words, the way God approaches judgment is very thoughtful. It's not angry. We think, okay, God is pouring out judgment because God is angry. But God pours out judgment in a very thoughtful way because it's not his nature to be judgmental. So here's a here's a great look because people think, well, in the Old Testament, God is all judgment. And in the New Testament, God is all love. And, and what we see here is that his love and his judgment, his love and his holiness, his love and his sense of justice are not in conflict with each other. Um, and so God is very thoughtful in the way that he approaches judgment because evil has an outcry to it. See, the people that are judged are judged based on how others are affected by their evil. And so it isn't just about the person being judged. It's about the people that were hurt by their sin. And so um, God says there's an outcry that comes uh, to me from evil. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit about the blood of Abel that cries from the ground. Um, and here we have the idea of uh, evil having an outcry to God, that there's there's a natural outcry that comes. And uh, also, you know, the people that are affected by evil naturally are crying out to God. And, uh, and so he's saying, okay, I'm going to go down and I'm going to... Um, I'm going to, to to look at this city and see if everything I heard is right. Of course, God knows whether it's right or wrong. But um, I love this story because um, you ask the question, why does God need to tell Abraham this? Um, um, why does God need to let Abraham know that uh, he's about to pour out judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah? And, um, and, and so, um, it, that's a very interesting question. And I think there's a few things we can look at here. Um, first thing is that, um, Abraham is going to be the promise, you know, through him is going to come the promised seed. Um, and, and that God, uh, reveals things to us, uh, and to, especially to Abraham because of his position. But I think more importantly here is God is testing Abraham to see if he will stand in front of God uh, and intercede. Will he stand in front of God between the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and himself uh, are, are in front of God? In other words, that's the, that's the, the, um, the posture of intercession. Um, and so God calls us to this ministry of intercession. It also pictures what Christ really does, is that he intercedes. He intercedes for the sinner. Um, I, I want you to see that here because there's no reason, in my view, there's no reason for God uh, to tell this to Abraham unless he wants Abraham to intercede. So Sodom and Gomorrah, and this is the second time Sodom and Gomorrah is called uh, grievously evil. Sodom and Gomorrah is, goes down in history as the most grievously evil cities uh, in the history of mankind, right? And so uh, just, and we'll, and we'll see a picture later on of things that are going on in the city. Uh, but uh, to, to, uh, to, when we look at the Bible, we see Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we look through history, uh, we always compare evil to Sodom and Gomorrah because they're looked at as the most evil cities. All that, what's interesting is we get into the New Testament, God condemns uh, Capernaum uh, because saying that if uh, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen Christ, they would have repented, and Capernaum didn't, and and so which is which is really interesting. But uh, we see this grave evil going on, and what's the heart of God? He's looking for an intercessor. He's looking for someone to stand in a gap. He's looking for someone to come and and uh, bring salvation. And of course, that's the ministry of Christ, right? It's also our ministry. To intercede for the sinner. Uh, it's not our ministry to hope for judgment. It's our ministry to intercede for the sinner. I think um, Abraham, as we have uh, studied him, we find that uh, Abraham must know by now that he's a sinner, right? 
uh, because he he let his wife remember he let his wife he gave his wife the Pharaoh so he did, he wouldn't get killed. Uh, they jumped ahead of God and 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 he he had relations with um, uh, uh, Sarah's uh, servant and forced him into forced her into this relationship and uh, they had Ishmael. Uh, Abraham knows that he's a sinner, right? And and yet God is calling him to intercede. I, I, I think it's kind of funny. Like God is saying, hey, there's a, a lot of sexual immorality going on down in Sodom there. I think we're going to um, destroy this place. And uh, Abraham's probably thinking, oh, is, is that what you do with people who are sexually immoral? <laughs> because Abraham himself was sexually immoral, right? And and, uh, and committed this act with with this woman that wasn't his wife, you know, and brought her and forced her to be his wife and, and, and the whole thing. So um, there are, I, w I want you to just think about this. There are, there are two kinds of righteousness in the Bible. There is... Um, horizontal righteousness and there's vertical righteousness right well the horizontal righteousness is how we treat people so that's where we look to the outside and we say um yeah this this guy is really righteous he he cares for other people he's a good person um and so that's the righteousness we see but here's here the thing is with horizontal righteousness is no one is truly righteous no one is sinless. No one has a, a, a free uh, record that's no, that has no blemishes on it. Um, but um, vertical righteousness is righteousness that comes from God, and it's given to us. Uh, vertical righteousness uh, is God declaring us righteous. Uh, Abraham was righteous because he received vertical righteousness from God. He he received righteousness from God. So then he's going to go into this prayer, um, and and look where he starts here. This is just such a great question. Remember, a this whole started with uh, God asking a question, and now Abraham is going to ask a question, and um, and and look at what he asks here. Um, yeah, bear with me just a second. Um, it says, Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Uh, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you, shall you not judge all the earth and do just? Um, that's, a, that's a really great question, and I'm going to get to Peter in just a second. Uh, but that's just such an awesome question. Let me just go back here. This is just so good. Um, he says, would you, would you judge the righteous with the wicked? I want you to see what, what Abraham is asking here. Um, he's not just asking, hey, won't, won't you take the, the righteous out of this city and then destroy the city? He's saying, uh, can't you just spare the whole city for 50 righteous people? Um, and so um, what, a couple things makes, it makes Abraham have this heart of, um, uh, of intercession. And, uh, and, and the first thing, as I mentioned already, is I think Abraham knew that he was a sinner. Uh, and so people who are sinners, who know they're sinners, tend to have uh, more compassion on other people who are sinners. I think that's the heart we are to have. Uh, you know, Jonah is the opposite of this. Jonah didn't think of himself as much of a sinner, and he couldn't stand the people of Nineveh. And he knew if he wanted Nineveh, God would probably have mercy on them, and he hated that. Uh, in fact, uh, Jonah's probably the worst prophet ever, even though he repented inside the fish that he was in. When he went to uh, Nineveh, and there was this great revival because he preached this, he was upset. He wanted God to judge um, the, the, the whole um, city. And the last uh, part of Jonah is a question from God. You know, should I destroy this city with uh, with 120,000 people? And 
cattle and and uh, and animals and everything. And that's how it ends. That's that question. It just ends with that question. And uh, and the reader is left to say, okay, well, God should do that. And again, you see the heart of God. The heart of God is towards mercy. Um, Jonah didn't see God as a God of judgment. God, He saw him as a God of mercy, and he was upset about that. Um, Abraham wants to appeal to God's mercy. God wants to appeal to God's grace because he's a sinner. His nephew Lot is there, whom he had uh, adopted as a son. And so he's thinking to himself, well, are there other people like me who have faith in you, who trust in you? And of course, he's thinking that Lot is one of those people. Uh, so he says, uh, will you destroy the whole city if there are 50 righteous there? Uh, I want you to see what God answers. God answers, I'll spare the whole city if there are 50 righteous people. So just think about this. The, the most evil, wicked city in, uh, in, the, in the history of the world. God is saying, if I find right, 50 righteous people, I will, I'll, I'll keep, I, not only will I save those righteous people, I'll spare the whole city. And now we're going to find that God doesn't find 50 righteous people and possibly not even, uh, well, well, we'll go on to, to, to Abraham's prayer. Uh, a lot of people talk about here how Abraham, if he had gone down to one person, God would have said yes, and Abraham stopped too soon. Uh, maybe, perhaps, uh, that, that is the case. But I tell you, for me, I probably would have stopped right here. If I was standing in the presence of God and I would say, hey, will you, if there's 50 people will, will you, that are righteous, will you spare the city? And God said, yes, I'd be like, great, okay. Uh, but Abraham goes on. And so uh, this is such an amazing prayer uh, in, in so many ways. Um, so let me uh, go on and read this. And by the way, let's, let's before I do that, let's talk about Lot. Um, this is a, uh, this scripture from Peter, second Peter six, eight really is like, um, just so confusing sometimes to me when I read the story of Lot, but this is what Peter said about Lot. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to extinction, uh, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. He's talking about God's judgment. Uh, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his, tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Um, so there's this description of Lot by Peter that he is tormented by all the sin that is around him. Now, when we read the story of Lot in Genesis, we don't really see that guy. We see a guy who goes and looks. First, he, he pitches his tent near Sodom. Then he's inside Sodom. When these angels come, they're going to say, you got to get out of the city. And it, they're going to talk about how Lot tarries and he waits because he doesn't want to leave. And uh, finally, when he does leave, we're going to find later on, uh, you know, just to spoil the movie, uh, Lot's going to do some bad stuff later on. And yet he's called righteous here. And remember, this gets us back to this idea of vertical righteousness and horizontal righteousness. Um, Lot, for some reason, had a enough faith and trust in God to be declared righteous. And, and honestly, if Peter didn't say this about Lot, Probably all throughout church history, all the uh, church, the Bible scholars would say, oh, Lot's definitely uh, burning in hell. He was just an unrighteous man. Uh, but there's this statement about Lot being righteous and tormented in his soul. Um, and, and there's a great picture there of really what happens to the Christian who lives in sin. Uh, because when we are disobedient to God, what it creates in us is a torment in our soul. Um, so I think this is especially true with sexual sin. Christians who fall into sexual sin fall into a, a, a certain type of torment. Uh, and I'm not talking about worldly people or people that aren't, aren't saved. They don't feel the guilt as much. Uh, but people who know Christ 
and go into sexual sin or go into other kinds of sin or live this double life. They live this life of torment uh, because they're, they are, they're pulled out of this. Their spirit is tormented inside of them uh, because of the sin that is around them, because God is trying to pull them out. God is trying to set them free, and they're going back to their bondage. And so I think there's a real picture there of Lot, who is living in sin and yet tormented in his soul. Um, and, and yet, um, the Bible calls him righteous. Um, and, and that's just really amazing, uh, because what it really comes down to is our righteousness isn't, isn't attained horizontally because as good as we might be, as much as people like us, that's not the righteousness that brings us into the presence of God. The righteousness that brings us into God's presence is vertical. It's given to us by God. Um, and so we are to love God and love our neighbor. We receive righteousness from God, and then we are free to love our neighbor, which is vertical righteousness. Uh, but I, I can never say, um, well, you know, I was exceptionally good today, God. I, I really, you know, I really... I really killed it loving my neighbor today and then have God say to me, wow, you know, I'm more impressed with you. I love you more than I did yesterday. That's not how my relationship with God works. Neither is that how your relationship with God works. The way it works is, um, is God gives you his righteousness. He looks at you, uh, through the, through the work of Jesus Christ. He looks at you and he looks at me and says, I see no sin. I only see righteousness. But let me move on to this prayer. This prayer is just um, so, so beautiful. Uh, I just love this prayer and a real picture of intercession, of how intercession works. Um, Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, uh, and I who am dust and ashes. Um, Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it for 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let the Lord not be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way. And when he had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham, well, when he has finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. So, so a few thoughts about this prayer. Um, it is possible if Abraham went down to one, that perhaps the whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah would have been saved if, if he, if he went to one. But I, I don't think that's the point of this prayer. I think the, there's there's a there's a couple things that we can learn from this. Um, this prayer was a humble prayer, uh, but it was also a bold prayer, and I think that's a great picture of how we should pray. Um, it was not presumptuous, but it was also um, it, it was it was also full of faith. Um, uh, it it was um, it was you know, Abraham realized who he was, and yet he was also bold. He called himself dust and ashes. And that's really what we are. We're made from the dust of the earth, the ashes of the earth, right? We, we're made from dust, and we will become ashes, right? So, uh, and, and he says, that's all I am. Without God's power, without God's, without uh, the power of Christ giving me life, all I am, all you are is dust and ashes, right? And he said, that's all I am. And yet dust and ashes can come into the throne room of God and ask God for, for things and be bold with God. Um, and so uh, that's really amazing because uh, God could say, shut your mouth. 
You know, um, and, and again, remember we went back to why did God ask the question of Abraham? Why did he do that? Um, and, and Abraham comes back with a question. So God asks the question, shall I hide this from Abraham? And remember, why do we talk about that? Because God is inviting him to intercede. I want you to catch that. God is inviting Abraham to intercede. Suppose Abraham just started and God said, shut up. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do this. Or he said, this is what I'm going to do. Um, or suppose Abraham just said, uh, well, you know, that's, yeah, you're God. Do whatever you want, right? Uh, what's going on here is God is inviting Abraham to intercede. God does the same thing with Moses. God says uh, to Moses, um, leave me alone so I can destroy this people, and I'll make you into a great nation. That's what he says to Moses. And and uh, and and why does God say that? Because he's inviting Moses to intercede, and that's what Moses does. Um, there are similarities between this prayer and Moses' prayer. One of the, the similarities are uh, they both appeal to who God is. So Abraham's prayer here appeals to who God is. Are you one who destroys the righteous with the wicked? And the answer is no, right? He says, far be it from you to be that kind of God, right? Um, and so Abraham says, is this really your character that you would destroy the righteous with the wicked? Great question. Great question to ask God. And the, and the answer is no. God says no. In fact, God says, if I found uh, 50 righteous there, and he goes down to 10, if I find 10 righteous people there, I'll save the whole city. That, that's how God answers. And then Abraham stops. Um, Moses' prayer is a little bit uh, different. It's similar in that he says, you promise to take us into the promised land. And if you don't do it, then all the world will say that God just brought them in. Yahweh brought them into the desert to kill them. Right. Uh, and, and again, he's saying, are you the type of God that lies? And God says, no, I'm not. Right. And, and so um, that's how they're similar. They're different in this way where uh, Abraham, uh, G Moses' prayer is a little bit more bold, uh, and he says, uh, you promised us, so you follow through with what you said. Uh, Abraham is more of a, uh, you know, let me try one more thing, let me try one more thing, let me try one more thing. But both of them are very bold prayers, and yet very humble prayers. And that's a great picture of how prayer should be. Um, it's... Um, uh, yeah, a lot was interesting. <laughs> that's a that's a great uh, uh, that's a great statement. Antoinette says a lot was interesting. Uh, that's um, uh, you know that that is a um, a um, understatement to say the least. Uh, but we're all interesting, aren't we? That's that's how God made us. Uh, and and so um, let me get back to what I was talking about. Um, so, uh, here's, here's the beauty of Abraham's prayer. Uh, it is humble and yet it's bold. And I would say that we are invited into the presence of God to make humble and bold prayers. Um, we are invited into the presence of God to question, to question him. Uh, and God lets us. Now, the reason why we're able to do that is because of what Christ has done. See, Abraham was able to do what he did because Christ had made the way, even though his death on the cross was going to be in the future, it goes back in time and allows him to to be boldly come to the throne of grace, as the scripture says, and and make our requests known to him. Uh, and that's, that's incredible. Um, I, I've always, when I was younger, I would say, boy, I'm I'm a, I'm a Christian, and one of the things God wants me to do is he wants me to pray, and I don't pray enough, and I always felt guilty about that. Uh, I looked at prayer the wrong way. I looked at prayer as uh, an obligation instead of an invitation, um, and, and when you see prayer as an invitation, it changes the whole dynamic. God is inviting you into his presence to pray your heart to him, and and God acts and moves based on your prayer. Um, what would have happened if Abraham didn't pray, right? Well, I, I God said, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah. This place deserves to be destroyed. And, um, and he let Abraham know about it. And Abraham said, fine. 
what would have happened. Well, we don't know, but it's quite possible that God uh, changed his direction based on the prayers of Abraham. Uh, you know, and uh, thanks, Antoinette. She says, uh, that's so true with prayers. Amen. Um, and and so um, uh, Sunday, I, I made a little joke, but I, I mean it when I said this. I said, um, look, if you get angry with me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to God and talk behind my back. And don't talk behind my back to all the people in the church, but go to God and complain about me. In fact, I want you to do that because if you're complaining about me, you're praying for me. Uh, and so um, all prayer is an act of grace. Even if you're going to God and you're praying for God's judgment on someone, um, the fact that you can come into the presence of God at all, that I can come into the presence of God at all, is an act of God's grace and mercy on me because I am not righteous enough to stand in the presence of God. Um, and thank you, Antoinette. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I know you do pray for me, so thanks. Um, and I pray for you as well. Uh, but um, uh, prayer prayer is um, a, a great, um, uh, not only an opportunity, but an act of God's grace for us. And so uh, there have been many times I start out in prayer saying to God, I'm angry at this person and I'm just, you know, God, you got to help me, you know. And what God always does is he changes my heart. That's why people don't want to pray for someone they're angry at, because um, if we're angry at them, we know God will change our heart towards them. Why do you think Jesus said pray for your enemies? Uh, do, do, do you think Jesus might know what he's talking about when he says that? Uh, well, you know, what happens? You pray for your enemies. Maybe you start out saying, God, smite this person, right? But by the time you're done praying, you're praying for that person uh, because, because God is changing your heart. God is changing your attitude. Um, and so um, I, I think I shared this before. Uh, there's this person that came to me. He was talking to me. Uh, this was a couple years ago. He's talked to me about politics, and he says, there's this one person that I can't stand this politician, and, and I just, I, I, I just, um, he didn't say I hate this person, but he was just like, I just can't stand this person. And I said, that's the person you need to pray for. Uh, and, and I said, Jesus didn't say pray for your friends. He said, pray for your enemies. If you think this person is your enemy, then you need to pray for them, and you need to pray for them every day. And he didn't like that statement from me, uh, <laughs> but um, but but it's true, right? Because God is much more concerned with our hearts and than and our attitudes towards people, um, and so this is such a beautiful prayer. And you know, I believe Lot was spared uh, because of this prayer. Um, and just see what we. Um, I think I'm at the end of the scripture here for today. Because uh, we can get into Psalm and Gomorrah next week. Yeah, I'm, at, I'm, in, I'm at the end. Um, so, um, so I'm going to leave you with that today because next week uh, we're getting into Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, next week we'll probably, I, there is um, uh, a thing I have to go to. So it's Christmas time, so it's just crazy. So I probably will uh, try to do a, um, a pre-recording for next week. It should come on at seven o'clock. Uh, so I won't be able to interact live with you, but I will check, uh, the, the, um, the comments just like I do on Sunday morning. So, uh, God bless you guys. And, uh, let me pray uh, for you. Father, in Jesus name, we pray for just, um, your presence, Lord, right now we intercede we intercede, Lord God, for, for those that we know who are living in sin. We intercede for those that are, are that we're struggling with. We intercede for those that deserve your judgment just like us. But we pray, Lord, if there is if there is fifty righteous in that city, if there's forty five, if there's thirty, if there's twenty, if there's ten, if there's one, Lord, we pray that you will spare uh, you you will spare people. You will spare people we love, Lord, that you would bring them to you. Uh, and Lord, we pray that you would change our attitude and change our hearts. Give us the heart of Abraham, who knew he was a sinner, and interceded. Give us the heart of Christ, 
who intercedes for us night and day. Uh, God, we pray you give us that attitude and that heart today in Jesus' name. And I pray for everyone that's been on this uh, broadcast tonight uh, uh, or this live video that you would minister to them, you would touch them, and uh, we pray your blessings on them today in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Kellyanne. Uh, thanks for joining tonight. Great to see you. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, Shirley. Um, I want to also remind you on um, Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock, we are going to have our candlelight service. We weren't able to do it last year. Uh, so we're doing it this year. We're excited to have that back and uh, and be able to do that again. So uh, let's join us if you're able to come uh, at six o'clock on um, on that's a Saturday, that's a Friday, uh, December twenty fourth, uh, and it's going to be a one hour service. And then on the nineteenth, we're going to have a special uh, service here, a special Christmas service. Be a great time to come. Uh, hope you're enjoying the holidays, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, Sunday and next week. God bless you guys tonight.